So the title of this talk is My Second Brain, Putting the Smart in Smart Devices. And what I mean by that is ever since I started using a smart device, maybe four years ago, I've created kind of a workflow that I'd like to share that essentially allows me to find lots of information. So collect it, sort it, or curate it into what is the important information for the things that I want to do, and then how to turn that into a bigger concept or conceptualize that information into a bigger picture. I'm going to divide this up quickly into a why, what, and how, and then there's going to be individual videos for each of the apps I use. Before I get into the why, what, and how, if you're watching this on a podcast, I want to give you a QR code so that you can download the Prezi directly, or I'm going to also give this as a presentation, so this will provide an opportunity for people to download the Prezi themselves or find the Prezi themselves. All right, so back to why. We're going to go through why, the what, and the how. The why is essentially... I like to create big picture diagrams. So one of the things I like to do is study student success in my a and 2 courses. And I'm going to go into this in detail later on, so I won't do it now. You can, you can click on the link if you go to the Prezi and you can see this bigger Prezi. But essentially, I like to collect all of my thoughts on the student success into one large diagram of Prezi. I do this for other things like why study nutrition. I do this for my nutrition class. And essentially, I can present my entire course in Prezi itself. So there's certain places in here where you see lots of slides, so essentially it's taking the place of PowerPoint for me. I've started podcasting. I've done podcasting for about four years now, and it's nice to have a Prezi out there if anyone's interested in why a podcast or how to podcast, what are the different tools. And at the top left, I break it down into it depends on the size of the picture. So you'll use different cameras or different screen captures or different programs, Camtasia and Premiere, depending on the size of the image that you want to basically project. So, for example, if you want a small little drawing, a little webcam is nice. But if you have a highly detailed, then you might you might want to use screen capture. So anyway, it allows me to organize my thoughts on why I podcast, why I think we should create textbooks that are more spatial and not linear. And that's why I'm a big fan of Prezi is because it allows this panning in and out. So you always kind of keep this top down, bottom up connection going. I also have ones on like why I think Twitter should be used in the classroom, why it's good for professional development and things like that. This is a different app that's called Bubble Us, and I know that it's not really readable at this point, but in my nutrition class, we wanted to talk about Latch on New York City, which is New York City's law, to no longer discuss formula or provide mothers with formula unless they ask first. So you can't send a mother home with a can of for formula. Anyway, I broke it down into what are the steps in critical thinking? What are the details of the program? Who are the stakeholders? So nurses and the hospital and infants and the formula company and the parents are all stakeholders. So it's a way for me to present an argument to a nutrition class very spatially rather than linearly so that they can see all the different factors that go into was New York City correct or incorrect in putting this limitation on formula in hospitals. This is kind of a huge concept map that I keep and I'm constantly adding to it. It's the future of teaching in A&P. So again, I'll come back to this to show you a little bit more detail later, but it's all my different thoughts on different technology uses, um, horizon reports, different ways that I want to teach essentially. This is my why Evernote, so why I use Evernote, which I'll also come back to. But again, I like these kind of big pictures, these big concepts, so that I can map out why I should be using these tools. This is, uh, I don't always use this for education. This is my soccer map, in fact. This is red is defensive strategies, green is offensive strategies. And then some of the other things are being tough and being me mentally intelligent when you play soccer. So it's a way for me to organize lots of stuff. Why do I want to organize this? Because I think through organization, you can see new connections. I got this from a website on concept mapping. And essentially, if you're at the very bottom, rote learning requires little or no relevant knowledge. And there's usually no emotional commitment. But if you can move up to well-organized information, and if you can motivate the student or motivate yourself to have an emotional commitment, then you get meaningful learning. Meaningful learning leads to creative productions. And again, I use the definition of creativity as you see connections that other people can't necessarily see. Once people hear about those connections from you, they're like, oh, that's brilliant. But you are able to see connections that other people can't see simply because you're well organized. What that creativity allows you to do, and this is the illustrated guide to a PhD from Matt Might. I'm not really trying to advocate for PhDs, but one of the beauties of advanced learning is you're pushing out the amount of knowledge that the world has. So what they're showing here is in the little blue dot is basically that's your elementary education, then your high school education, then your college education. And if you keep going, and again, I don't think you need to be in a PhD program to do this, but you want to push out the envelope of human knowledge at some point. I think the way to do that is to be creative, 
to have lots of organization so you can see the big picture. I don't know that this Carl Sagan thing necessarily fits in here, but it always gives me perspective of the amazing amount of information that's out there. And it always gives me this desire to, to be a lifelong learner. So the way I see this all is organization helps me to see things that other people can't necessarily see. That allows me to be creative and try and push out the boundaries definitely within myself about what I know, but also in humanity and itself. I don't know that I've come up with anything brand new in education, but I'm certainly trying and that helps me to see the big picture and just basically be in awe of knowledge. So that's the why. The what is fairly short. So I have a background in neuroscience, and I know there's a lot of different ways that you can discuss memory, but the way I like to discuss memory is you have three types. You have sensory memory, and that's basically environmental stimuli are coming in, and you're deciding what's important. So when you hear your name from across the room, that information is important. When you feel the clothes on your back, that's not important, so you sort that out. So the way I kind of have a metaphor for this as far as using a smartphone is that sensory information is all the information that's out there, and you have to sort what is important. You have to put that somewhere where you can file it away, and you may not be able to attend to it right then, but you have to file it away where you can come back to it later. So I have apps that allow me to basically keep things in my short-term memory. Then what I'd like to do is to be able to move things into long-term memory, but that requires me to have some organization because I have to have the time to know where that short-term information fits in to the knowledge I already have in my brain. So in memory, we call those, we call those schema. So long-term memory is composed of huge schema knowledge structures, networks of information. And then once you have those knowledge structures, it's much easier to store more information. So it, so it improves your short-term to long-term memory if you kind of already have this big map. And again, the way I think about this is you have sensory memory, which are apps that allow you to collect lots of information. You have short-term memory that allows you to store those things that you think are important, but maybe you don't have time to attend to them right there. And then you have long-term memory apps, maps that allow you to create these big concept maps. So these big schema, as in long-term memory, where you can keep adding information. It also improves your ability to take short-term memory and put it into long-term memory because all you have to do is put things into a map that you've already constructed. So now that I have large maps on my success in AMP2 or Y podcast, it's a pretty simple matter to think about things just in terms of how they fit into that map. I don't have to take as long to figure out how those fit into what I already know. So having a bit of my brain mapped out in Prezi helps me to learn more information quicker and to see more connections. So one of my first filters before I even go through an app really is I collect things and then I don't necessarily have time to attend to them right away. So I divide up all the papers and the podcasts and the books that I want to read into pedagogy technology and content. And I also just wanted to point this out that I like this map because we're generally used to thinking about a teacher needs pedagogy and understanding on how to teach and also content knowledge for my sake that would be an AP and nutrition knowledge. But I also think we've got a third component nowadays especially as we're having students go into highly technical fields like my students are generally going into medicine. They need to have a technology appreciation. So I also think that I need to have a technology appreciation in order to not only model to them, but also to get the most out of their learning. So I generally divide things up into, is this content that I'm talking about, is it related to a &P? is it related to pedagogy, or is it related to technology? And then I wanna sort all of that information and figure out what's the relevant information for me, what works for the way that I wanna teach, and what fits into my schema that I already have. So I'm going to go just through some apps that I use, again, to increase my access to information, allow me to, to sort things from different knowledge streams. Probably one of my favorite apps, although there's others that I like even more, but I really, really like iAnnotate. And the reason I like iAnnotate, this is one of the first times that you can really highlight and save those highlights, and you can annotate those notes. Now I'm going to move through tiny little videos because I want to show you this, but the biggest thing, and this is one of the reasons I don't necessarily like book readers, is you can highlight but it won't copy and paste those highlights into something else so that you have a quick distillation of what you highlighted. But I annotate, if you can get something in PDF, when you highlight it, you can email just the highlighted content or just your annotations. So one of the first things I should probably talk about is how I'm recording my iPad. I'm using an app called Reflector, and Reflector allows me to essentially use my iPad as an AirPlay device. So just like you play your iPad onto an Apple TV, this allows me to play my iPad onto my PC. So then I can record it with Camtasia. I think it's a little bit easier. You can do other things. For example, you can use things like explain everything to record your screen, but I think it's just gonna be easier to use Camtasia. 
One of the first apps I'd like to talk about, actually I think it's kind of interesting that I think I really do use my iPad as a second brain, so I even call the folder that has most of the apps I use DJ Second Brain. One of the first ones I'll go through is something called iAnnotate. I really like iAnnotate because it allows me to highlight and create annotations and then save those to email so I can even email them over to Evernote. So for example, I've got this Delphi report that talks about critical thinking and I can go through and I can highlight in different colors and all of the stuff on the left is customizable so I can change the color of the highlighting if I want to. It's also really convenient for highlighting because it has this scroll button so you just scroll and then you scroll and then say you find something that you want to highlight you can easily hit markup and then start highlighting again and again it looks a little funny here but it does actually highlight it well enough that the notes are kept. I can then create specific notes, annotations if I want to, So I can make specific notes, but I think the coolest thing about iAnnotate is this right here. I can email a PDF as a fully annotated file or as a flattened file. And what a flattened file is, is essentially it captures your highlights, captures your annotation, and puts those in a separate email. So uh, without actually sending the email, it shows that it's captured all of my highlights. So right in here you can see at the top there is where I just typed in a note called I annotate and I also highlighted just below that this research employed a powerful quality of Delphi, Delphi method so it allows me if one of the points of this whole entire talk is to be able to filter information I really like I annotate because it allows me to filter large reports and get that information into something smaller and more digestible in fact I don't really want to type it out but usually what I'll do is I'll email to my Evernote Evernote, when I have Evernote, it gives me an email address, and so I can just email those notes over into Evernote. So then I'm going to capture everything. Now, I don't want to go through these apps in full detail, I suppose, but there's a lot of a lot of different things that you can do with iAnnotate if we edit the toolbar. So if we put all tools, so you can use pencil, you can use signatures, you can jump around in a long PDF really, really well. You can import things from the web. There's just quite a few tools. Email that document, like I said, email annotations, bookmark things, put in photos and things like that. So I really like iAnnotate. So next is GWiz. Again, I'm going to go back to the video. Another app that I like a lot is GWiz. GWiz allows me to organize basically all my Gmail stuff or my Google stuff. So Gmail, I get a lot of subscription emails. I like to keep it keep an eye on my uh, comments and things like that just to make sure nothing inappropriate is done so that's why I have 2600 emails here they're mainly from YouTube I can also put in my calendar so that I can see what I have to do today I have Rebecca's party tonight I can do news I nice see about news is you can actually set priorities you can set certain search topics so as I have here I've got education as a search topic or I have higher education as a search topic so then I can read news specific to higher education I have a Google Voice account so that students can text me and I can get that on my iPad. I don't really have much for music, but I have my YouTube account and then I have my Google Drive. And so GWiz allows me to organize all of that content pretty quickly in one app. Next up is iTunes U. Honestly, I don't have a whole lot on iTunes U on my iPad because I tend to download things with iTunes and put it right on my iPod where I can carry that around and listen to it better. But I have a few things, like I have my coursework in a course where students can basically listen to podcasts of mine. Or if I want to follow Education Is from Kirkwood, that's on my iTunes. Another one is TED Education. Again, you can get basically info. Listen to the materials if you want to listen to the materials. Again, it's just another source of information on education or thinking or even just hobbies that allow me to process that information quickly, sort it out for what things are important to me, and then use that information to conceptualize bigger thoughts. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is Coursera. There's supposed to be an actual Coursera app, but I can't seem to be able to get it to log in. So I'm going to have to go back and use Safari. But that'll work too. So these are some of the courses that I'm currently taking. Creativity, Innovation and Change, Inquiry Science Learning. There's a lot of actually big data in education, a lot of teaching-based courses. But it's not all teaching-based if I can come back and look at my course records. Now I'm going to be a little embarrassed to show that I'm not really completing these courses. 
but I'm downloading the videos and still trying to take advantage. I really like the model thinking class. I would highly recommend that one's coming up again. Organizational analysis was not a very good course. So one of the things you can do is see the goods and bads of delivering online videos and things like that. How to reason, clinical problem solving. And I can just show you back real quick some of all the courses that they offer. So they offer courses in multiple languages, multiple categories, chemistry. So I'm reading off here to the left, the different categories of videos and courses they have, and then off to the right, some of the courses. Now most of the Coursera courses, I just like to follow the videos again and learn from that instructor's style, but you can actually get certification with a signature track on some of these as well. Anyway, I like downloading the Coursera videos and just listening to them while my hands are busy, but my brain is free, and I would highly recommend them. Next up is Twitter and TweetDeck. Now I have TweetDeck down on my Prezi, but honestly TweetDeck does not work very good on an iPad. It's not even designed for iPad at this moment. It's very nice on the PC, but it's not very good on the iPad. So I'm going to switch back to Twitter. I would say if you're on the PC, TweetDeck is way better than using Twitter. But if you're on the iPad, Twitter actually is better. The reason I like Twitter, you can actually look at one of my concept maps about why to use Twitter. But I'm mainly a lurker. You can see that I really haven't tweeted that much. But I like to follow certain people that are in education, so TED Talks and Learning Catalytics, and Eric Major is really a good person. But you can also follow particular hashtags if you'd like to. So you can search for a particular hashtag and see what's going on in EdTech. Or again, I like Eric Major because he tweets a lot. He was basically the inventor of the clicker, and now he uses something called Learning Catalytics also. He's got some really nice videos on the future of technology and education, I think, on YouTube. So while I'm mainly a lurker and I don't really necessarily post, it's a great place to go. Twitter's a great place to go if you just want to see what's kind of interesting or what's kind of new. So web pages that are kind of interesting, maybe. It's kind of a nice brainstorm to find blog posts. See what's new in Open Courseware at MIT. That's kind of an interesting one. I should probably read that one. So, seeing that right there, I can quickly email that to myself. And now I'm going to come back to that and read that in Evernote. Next up is listening to podcasts. Podcasts are one of my favorite ways to learn because you can do it while your hands are busy, but your brain is free. So you can gather new information while you're driving, while you're cleaning out the garage, while you're mowing the lawn, things like that. Now, I have to be honest that most of my podcasts that I listen to, I actually put on my phone or on an iPod, not really on my iPad. So I'm kind of faking this a little bit. I use podcasts a lot on my phone. I like it a lot. It's not really working very well on my iPad. Um, I downloaded it, but it wants iOS 7, and I haven't done that yet because I'm a little scared to do that. So I'm going to open it this way, kind of how it looks like on my phone. So you can do a search for education, things like that, or you can subscribe to certain podcasts. Like I really like Radio Lab and like This American Life. But again, if, if you're interested in particular topics, then you can search for those topics. And then you can get podcasts. and. The good thing about Pocket Cast is it actually downloads it to your device. So on the iPad, that may, might be nice if you don't have Wi-Fi capabilities. You can download it right to the device. Another one I use on my phone a lot. It's going to be way here at the back because I just installed it. Because, again, it's mainly on my phone, not really on my iPod. But you can search again for things in education. You can browse. And, again, you got to pop up Radiolab I like a lot because it's kind of a neuroscience-based. TED Talks are always good. This American Life is always good for entertainment, news hour. The last one I'll go to is podcasts. 
So these are going to be linked to iTunes, essentially. So again, those same kind of podcasts that I like to listen to, This American Life, Big Ideas. So one of the biggest things about podcasts is you can listen to people kind of get the basis of what they're going to talk about without necessarily following them like david brooks honestly i probably wouldn't buy his book but the social animal was a good listen to i got most of it from just listening to the podcast or clay shirky talks about how basically youtube allows you to spread your cognitive surplus and that other can learn other people can learn from you so you can see some of the people i follow obviously are daniel pink who talks a lot about motivation anyway i like podcasts Near and dear to my heart, of course, is YouTube. I put up my first YouTube video in 2009. Um, it's awesome to post things, so you can see that basically I have lots of uploads to YouTube, mainly educational videos that allow my students to basically follow me if they would like to, to watch me draw things out in class. Get rid of that. Um, I can cruise through YouTube and put things down as a watch later, so different things that I want to watch. The McGurk effect is something that's I use in learning. Um, I also can put together playlists. Some of these are my playlists because I'm putting them together so my students can watch my videos at once. Or maybe I have educational ideas. Came back to Ray Junko on Twitter. Maybe stuff that's just really interesting. Google Talks. I really like Google Talks. Whether it's to kind of calm my brain or conversations with Dan Rome, who's talks in, talking to Nancy Duarte there. Nancy Duarte is somebody that's good in presentation skills. Guy Kawasaki as well. So I can follow Guy Kawasaki. He's kind of an entrepreneur. Teresa Amabile is progress. So she's anyway, lots of good talks. Got some TED talks in there. I can follow subscriptions. A lot of this is Expert Village because I use those kind of videos to learn how to coach my daughter's soccer team. TEDx Youth is always nice. Anyway, those are the people that I'm subscribing to. I have access to my favorites. It's my daughter Ella. What has Four legs and one foot. A bed. She's a funny kid. Anyway, so it's got all the people that I subscribe to. I keep a lot of information on YouTube, and then I can draw it back up and look at it later and gather that information. So very similar to YouTube, but different enough that it deserves its own mention, is TubeBox. So I have TubeBox here. What TubeBox does, if I can go back to the opening screen, is it allows me to download YouTube videos to the device for offline viewing. So I can come down here to add video. I'm going to add a YouTube video. And of course, it's got the regular top rated, top favorites, and most viewed. But I want to go over here to search. One of the people that I search a lot for, obviously, is Eric Majur. Again, I've mentioned him quite a few times. So I search for him now, and I see that there's actually a new video that I haven't downloaded onto my YouTube. So if I'm looking over at the right, if it's got a check mark, it's been downloaded to my iPad. If it's got a plus sign, basically it means that I can download it. So if I hit this one, I'm going to start downloading it to my iPad. Come back here to my videos. I've said this before, but essentially most of the videos and listening I do is actually on an iPod. So this does not certainly capture everything that I watch. But essentially a lot of Eric Majeur, Ken Robinson, I really like Richard Feynman, teaches me how to teach, so to speak, because his philosophy was you should be able to explain anything to a nine-year-old. Then if we look closely, this bottom one is the one that we just downloaded. So we can click over here on the arrow. It's going to take us to that video. Again, I could be offline at this point, and I could still watch this video. Students teaching one another has been very important in my classes. And I've unambiguously shown that it works. It helps students learn the material better. The question that we don't... So I think the big thing about podcasts and using TubeBox is that it essentially guarantees that you're going to have information no matter where you are, whether you're online, whether you're offline. As long as you have your smart device with you, you have access to things to think about. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons it makes me smarter. It's because I'm never bored. I can always listen and think about something no matter what. So this one isn't a big one, but as a teacher, it sure is nice not to have to deal with those desk copies anymore. So I'm going to do course mark quick. 
CourseSmart will open up and I'll show you the different textbooks that I have on CourseSmart. So I have my main a and books and then other books that I'm looking at. So I can go to my main textbook, which is the Elaine Mara book. If I click on this, I can get a an index that's clickable and go to things. Now it's not nearly as nice as using iAnnotate to read because I don't really have a good highlight. And you can do these kind of box things, but that's not real advantageous. And you can do notes. You can see how clunky it is. It's just slow. Certainly not the way that I would want my students to have to read. It's not like I annotate where you can just kind of sweep over the text with your finger and it'll highlight. So it's not horrible. It's better than a desk copy because at least it's on this thin little iPad. I don't have to carry around this 20 pound, 25 pound book. But that's, but that's course smart. We'll do reading apps next. I'm going to do that really, really fast because I'm sure most everybody knows how to do that. But for the sake of completeness and how to gather information, got to do reading apps. I had to put them in their own little folder. So we'll do iBooks first. I don't really have a solid method or a solid app that I often use. You'll see that I don't really use Google Play, but I use you know, iBooks. This is Dan Rooms, blah, blah, blah. One of the problems I have with these types of apps is you can highlight, yes, but you can't really export those annotations into a concise or distilled file. And that's one of the reasons I really like iAnnotate is because it allows you to just email and distill out those annotations. You can highlight, but it's not really valuable to me, or it's not as valuable to me unless they can pull that out and copy and paste that into another document where I've just got my highlight. Playbooks, I don't really use Google Play all that much. Most of the books I have on there are free at this point. Usually a fan of Google, but I think um, it's just easier to get everything on all of my different devices if I use Kindle. Of course, I really like John Wooden. John Wooden just kind of gives you lessons in how to live your life and not really be concerned about necessarily winning, but you know, success is doing your best. So I'm sure I haven't added anything there to anyone's knowledge, but it is kind of nice just to for the sake of completing the whole picture of where I gather my different information, I do use reading, reading apps occasionally, although I'm much more partial to getting things into a PDF format so I can use anna I annotate and distill things more quickly. Next up is cloud storage, and on a simple level, it just means that you have a hard drive out there on the internet that's going to store your information. Now, if you've got Dropbox, you realize that that's really, really, really powerful because it means that you have access to your information at all times and on all devices. So I can get my AMP2 stuff on, on my phone, my iPad, my Nexus, everything that I have, any computer. I have my teaching materials available. It also frees you up to buy really cheap computers. Like I'll go to the ReStore, which is a Goodwill store where you can buy old computers. You can buy a four-year-old laptop for $100, and you don't really care if that laptop gets destroyed or starts failing on you because you've stored everything in the cloud, not on the device itself. So it really creates kind of a trunk computer, a computer that you can throw in your trunk. So I'll go to Dropbox here, and it's going to be a little bit messy. But again, the biggest thing is that you can have access to all your materials. So actually pay the additional money. It's like $10 a month to have 100 gigabytes of storage online. And so anything that I'm using in AMP2 is easily accessible on my iPad relatively quickly. So these are some of the things that I draw on the board or that I've made YouTube videos of. I don't think I'll load a PowerPoint, but I could also load a PowerPoint. Well, we'll load one quick. So I have my PowerPoint available to me. I can take the students through. I can review some of this stuff so that when I'm lecturing, I'm ready to go. DJ's a big fan of concept maps because it allows you to lay a lot of information out on one page. Almost essentially anything that I need, and this is why it gets kind of messy, but almost anything I need is in Dropbox, whether it's 
cool drawings, letters of rec for students. My schedule for the spring. Um, I won't open this one, but one of the biggest advantages is you can access your gradebook. If you use Excel as a gradebook, you can access your gradebook from your iPad, from your phone, at home if a student has a question about something. Obviously, a little bitty notes about things at times. When I'm putting together a presentation like this, I like to keep everything on Dropbox so that I can work on it at home if I'd like to work on it at home. It's also a way to get something over to I annotate rather quickly because I can put the PDF in Dropbox, then through Dropbox, I can pretty quickly open it into I annotate. So it's a nice smooth way to get something off my computer at home or my computer on my desk and get it into my iPad really quickly. So then I can read it on iAnnotate. I almost only read on iAnnotate at this point because it just is so much easier to highlight and create notes. Some other storage that is available, even though I don't use it a lot, is Google Drive. Now Google Drive is going to be in my GWiz. So I don't want to open the email texting list, but essentially I essentially have a Google form that allows students to enter their phone number or a different email if they would like for me to tell them when I'm going to be sick. So if they put their number in on mornings I'm sick, I have this email texting list. I'll open it up, but then I'll just blur it out. Google also, Google Drive also allows you to do Google Docs, which means that I can have students send me their presentations or they can collaborate on those presentations using Google Docs. Another one that I don't really use a lot, I haven't really used a lot because I got Box, this is Box, and the reason I got Box was in case I ran out of space in Dropbox, but I did just go ahead and subscribe to Dropbox, so now I pay for additional storage. Otherwise, Dropbox has about two gigs, which isn't a whole lot. It's not enough to put all of my teaching materials on. So I was gonna spread my stuff across Drive, box and Dropbox but now I just went ahead and paid for everything on Dropbox one other solution that I like another solution that I like that's relatively new to me but I like it quite a bit is that I have a drive sitting on my desk at home a hard drive that basically communicates with my computer via Wi-Fi and I can communicate with my iPad through the internet or off of Wi-Fi Wi-Fi. So essentially these are all files on a hard drive sitting on my desk right next to me at this moment and I can access them kind of like Dropbox but it's not necessarily out there and publicly. Alright so that's cloud storage and then also Seagate storage. So I have to admit that this one is not real real valuable but I've used it at times and that's Amazon Cloud Player and the way that I've mainly used it is I would find things on iTunes that I wanted to be able to listen to on my phone, which is an Android phone. And so the easiest way to get it over to my Android is to download it from iTunes, put it up to Amazon MP3 player, and then download it back again or stream it on my phone from Amazon. So you can see that I would put up some podcasts or obviously my, we'll go ahead and blame that on my wife, the Desperate Housewives, actually. That's not mine at all. But Educause or, you know, it's a way to get some music too. Okay, so this one's a bit of a dangerous one. I'm going to do uh, Reddit. And the app I use to cruise Reddit is Alien Blue. Now, the reason it's dangerous is because it can be a huge time suck. You're also going to see lots of swearing, and you can see a lot of inappropriate stuff, actually. I mean, a lot of the really, really bad stuff that made the news about Reddit was a couple of years ago, and it was all basically constructed as a troll. So you'll see right away that it's kind of a time suck, but it's kind of funny, too, to see Stephen Hawking run over Jim Carrey's foot. Um, just a quick, you're probably going to see some swearing in here, so maybe not look really closely. There's a lot of memes, stuff like that. So there's one that's NSFW, so not safe for work. We won't open that one. Um, a lot of, I, I still like to cruise the main page of Reddit because there's news and there's politics and things like that. 
There's also a lot of current events and nutrition occasionally. But the real power of Reddit is, if I can open this back up, is there are subreddits. Lots and lots of subreddits. So my daughter has rats, so that's why rats is in there. Parenting, if you want to read Reddit on parenting. The big beauty of Reddit is basically, yeah, that's probably not one that I want to put up. More so because it scares me as a father of a 12-year-old and an 8-year-old. So we'll move to something else. Teaching, so there's posts. And what I was starting to say before I noticed what the top post was is the beauty of Reddit is you vote. People vote comments up and down. So essentially whatever's at the top has been voted up. And so you can open one of these and see why, what are teachers discussing as iPads versus Chromebooks. So the news is there. You can read the article. And then again, here's the value is the comment section. So a bunch of people are commenting on the value of a Chromebook versus an iPad. And of course, you're going to get a lot of trolls and a lot of junk like that. But it's kind of the price you pay. Explain like a five is kind of great as a teacher because, again, I subscribe to Feynman and Einstein's opinion that if you can't explain it to a nine-year-old, you don't truly understand it. So it's nice to see people try and explain things like that. Data is beautiful is kind of nice. So this guy sent a bunch of articles to different open access journals that have very scientific names to see if they were truly peer reviewed. And the problem with this as a nutrition instructor and as a science instructor is you can make a journal look really, really legitimate by its name. So he's mapped out and it doesn't work, work real well on the iPad. So essentially what he's done is he sent out fake papers to various open journals and this one, it sounds very legitimate. It's called the European Journal of Biological and Life Sciences, and they accepted this fake journal. And also kind of interest, is interesting because it shows you where the editor is. The editor is in Korea, even though the journal or the publisher is in U United Kingdom. And so it's kind of this nice data is beautiful kind of mapping of where science is heading right now, which is kind of dangerous because it looks like legitimate science. Of course, I like technology. And I like politics. Ask Science is another nice kind of place to go if you're interested in science. Essentially, there's going to be tons and tons and tons and tons of Reddit, of subreddits. Everything from books, educational, particular areas of education if you're interested in history, teachers, TED. I want to learn is another good one. Although, I don't think I want to learn how to make my Chevy Cavalier more like a spaceship. But you get the idea that there's some very valuable information in Reddit. There's also a lot of wasted time there. But I think, by and large, at least for me, the positive outweighs the negative. Another good source, and they have their own app, is the New Media Consortium, who gives us the Horizon News. So generally they have blogs and they have updates up here all the time. A lot of K-12 library, but there's also higher education. And of course, the biggest thing I'm interested in from NMC is always the Horizon Report, which basically updates or predicts technology adoptions. So for example, they believe that within the next year or less, there's going to be a lot more massively open online courses, tablet computing, games and gamification, learning analytics, 3D printing, and then wearable technology. So. And the Horizon Report is just basically a, an awesome resource on what technology tools people think are coming down the horizon. And essentially, NMC usually attracts quite a few people to their board that decide these technologies, too. But also, there's just the day-to-day -day 10 hottest tech news items. Another one I like quite a bit but it seems to be having some trouble today is news 360 the reason I like it is because it's a kind of a quick way normally there'd be stories loading up here I noticed that the politics one did load today so just to show you kind of what it looks like but also at the top and again it's not really loading today I don't know if it's just my internet has slowed down this weekend or something but you can set it to search for particular topics like education higher education and of course I'm a parent and so I don't know, it's not working particularly well today, but in general, it's a way to quickly, quickly sort through news stories. I guess I'm trying to find one that's not necessarily hugely political. But then you can see the news. 
you can go to continue reading and you can go to the original article as well so it's kind of nice efficient way to read the news or bring up YouTube's so two others that I don't use a whole lot of but I use occasionally because they're kind of pretty is a flipboard and currents so they're very magazine like and you can set the different kind of things that you want to search for whether it's science or again you could come up here and you could search for higher education if you wanted to and then you could find different go to the Khan Academy and see if what flip flipboard has to say about the Khan Academy um, could look at technology it's just a nice way to kind of quickly, quickly browse through things and see if anything strikes your interest. Currents is Google's version. Uh, it's not quite as nice, I guess, as Flipboard, but I'm kind of a Google fan. So you can set up feeds. Like I have feeds. I haven't done a lot with this again, but welcome to the College of Education. I guess I like the week in education. So then you can browse through and see different things related to education. So if you wanted to hear about Bill Gates, talk about education reform. Might be something interesting to listen to. Looks like it's taking me over to Safari to watch this video. Anyway, that's Flipboard and Google Currents. Looks like it's taking me over to Safari to watch this video. Anyway, that's Flipboard and Google Currents. So I think this is the last of the apps that I use to sort information and in its Pulse. And I almost forgot it and it would have ruined the entire Prezi and the entire video because Pulse is just that beautiful. What Pulse is, is essentially it's a blog reader. If I can get it back to the opening screen, let me get this off there. Um, so Alan Paterka's, this is his blog. It's kind of nice because you can just click it quick and it brings it out. You can also email this blog to yourself if you'd like to. And again, I usually will email it back to Evernote. Um, you can change all the size and things like that. What I'm looking for is you can go to the web if you want to go to the web. If it's not showing up nice in Pulse, you can go to his actual website, his actual blog. Otherwise, Pulse is going to try and keep things within their context. Language is an awesome blog. Chronicle of Higher Education. Think Think Funk is right out of Solon. So this is a local teacher that teaches at Solon, teaches science, and he, it's a pretty, it's a pretty awesome blog. The other thing about Pulse is you can really quickly add new things. And I, in fact, I used to have this completely full. And then I don't know why I had to reinstall it and lost it. But again, you can really quickly put in other search terms. So I, I think I'd like to add TED Talks blog. Uh, read some news from them. See what the White House thinks. And then we're we're good. So it has added those blogs to my list. And if I go back now, it has those additional blogs in there. And it's just a really quick way to go through the blogs too. So to see what Alan's been doing lately, I can just browse through and say a new grading scheme. That's kind of interesting. Quickly, quickly read. You can star things if you'd like to. You can share things really quickly if you'd like to. That seems like a good one too. Might read it quick. The beauty of Pulse is I can go through it really quickly to think if, just to look really fast to see if this is something that's relevant to me. If it's relevant, then I'll put it into something else like Evernote. Good stuff. Anyway, that's Pulse. It's probably one of my favorite apps. So now we're moving over to short term and I have three apps here. And those apps are designed to basically be a file saving system or a file sorting system so that I can hold things kind of grouped together until I can actually conceptualize. 
So I'm going to start with probably my favorite. Probably say that at the beginning of the video too is Evernote. If you'd like to see kind of the map of why I like Evernote or all the different things, you can get that. So next is probably one of my favorite apps of all, and it's Evernote. And I'm going to open Evernote quick, but then I'm going to take you back to something else just to show you just the power of Evernote, because I've given a talk on this before. I'm going to go to Simple Mind. And Simple Mind allows me to kind of just brainstorm a lot of things. And I just want to show you real briefly that in the red, I can access my thoughts from lots of devices. So I can get to my notebooks from a Zoom or a computer or an iPhone or an I actually have an Android phone or an iPad or any computer allows me to get to my Evernote. So that's one of the power, powerful things about Evernote. I can also collect thoughts from multiple sources. So not only can I get to these notebooks from anywhere, I can put information in them from anywhere. So I can take pictures with my phone. I can do audio recordings so I can record a memo quick. I can type in text if I want to. My iPad will do it so I can take from YouTube or I can store things as TubeBox and then get it into Evernote if I'd like to. I can clip from Safari on my iPad. I can email to Evernote so if an app doesn't have an easy way to get something in Evernote, I could just use the email. Most news sites or web pages will have at least email me the story, and so I can email it directly into Evernote if I want to. Digo and Pulse also have, um, they don't go into Evernote directly, but they allow me to email to Evernote. In the PC or on my computer, I have a Chrome browser that has an app, so anytime I come across a web page that I really like, I can clip it right into Evernote. I can drag and drop images from Bubble Us, which is another site I'll show you. It's not an app, but it's a website. So then I can kind of use Evernote, kind of like I'm talking about this entire talk. I can sort through things, put it into Evernote, and then I can go back and process it in Evernote and put it in different files and different places, and I can collect things and kind of put them together to start conceptualizing. There are some other things, too. So you can use Sketch and Evernote Peak and Penultimate, which is kind of a, a notebook kind of app or collaboration. The only reason I'm showing you this concept map, because I'm going to come back to Simple Mind, is just to give you an idea of all the different ways you can use Evernote without necessarily spending a ton of time on it. So these are some of my different notes. So um, anytime I come across something that's that's that I found in one of those other apps that I did with sensory memory, I can get it over in Evernote and store it. And it's usually stored as really, really simple things, like don't forget to put some digestion question, questions in your learning catalytics. So it can be something really, really simple. You can download a PDF that you found and then open it so it's in Evernote. So this one obviously is about um, crowd learning and digital scholarship and learning from gaming and learning analytics and things like that. So it's kind of a it's a PDF that I haven't read yet, but I want to read. And so I'm storing it in Evernote right now so that I don't forget about it. Um, it corresponds with my notebook. So Slammers is my daughter's softball team. And so when I'm at the softball team and she's out there practicing, I can keep notes. So these are kind of my early drafts on what I wanted to do for this Land and Learn talk. So again, it allows me to take notes when I'm somewhere else. Um, if I have a picture that I've drawn out, I can keep it in Evernote. So this one's kind of upside down, but it's talking about mastering, which is Pearson's kind of LMS system. And I was, I don't know, they've done this learning catalytics thing now. They've acquired learning catalytics, and it kind of changes the whole way I look at mastering because now everything is prepped for mastering. Have the student do these quizzes. Have the student read this reading. But then ultimately, it's not all about just answering some multiple choice on some LMS. It's about answering clinically difficult questions along with collaborating with your peers in a classroom. I really, really like this learning catalytics. A lot of these I don't even necessarily know why they're in here, which is why it's kind of my really brief kind of just way to capture something. And then this is my inbox, so it's not really well sorted at this point. But what I eventually will do is I will sort things into notebooks. So here's Learning Catalytics, the thing I'm mentioning. And Learning Catalytics is kind of advanced clickers. So if I find something that's interesting, I can clip it here and I can come back to it. Um, other notebooks, if I can go, I have some work notebooks where I talk about Eagle Apps or the Learning Success Agenda or where I have projects. So why YouTube? Ultimately, the projects file is once I've kind of gotten somewhere and I want to do more with it. I guess I haven't really. I guess that one's locked. You can lock things down so other people can't see it if you'd like to. Um, when I want to put together iTunes U or when I have ideas on the ideal education or open education re resources or my plans for doing a flipped classroom. So essentially what you're seeing is a lot of my long-term to-do lists 
or sometimes I'll draw something out and I know I want to put it in a blog someday. So what this is pointing out is usually start in the upper right quadrant with informal thoughts. You gather information from YouTube and blogs and Twitter, and then you've got to have some kind of informal discussion that's in the lower right with your peers. Eventually you do something like I'm doing today, which is kind of creating a formal reflective presentation so that you can see basically where my technology thoughts are going. And then of course, some point I would like to do this more formally where it can be more collaborative. So maybe do a follow-up talk sometime where we can all discuss how we're using these techniques to gather information and conceptualize. Um, again, so Evernote is just my major place where I think about my big picture. Another one of the biggest projects that I have that I'm working on is something I call Big Picture Physiology. And I want to use Prezi, this program that I'm presenting with today, to basically create entire spatial textbooks for my A&P class. So I'm drawing it out. It's taken me a long time. It's a huge project. I've been doing it for a couple of years now. Actually, I'm a little embarrassed to say. But I keep it all posted, or I keep track of it in Evernote. So it's not really my long-term memory at this point because it's still something that I'm working on. It's kind of interesting to go back and look at how two years ago I was saying, what are the things, why are the reasons you use smartphones? And it's really interesting to look that most of these apps that I would have talked about two years ago when I gave a talk like this in KSELT, I'm not using anymore. I'm not using Chrome Marks. I'm not using Read It Later. I'm not using Chrome to phone. It's amazing that two years ago I was really happy with my smartphone. And even in the last two years, not using Double Twist. So many of the apps that I was using two years ago, I'm not even using anymore. All right, so that's Evernote. Honestly, the next one is more of something that I wish I would use more often, but I don't use it yet, and that is Adobe Ideas. The reason I like Adobe Ideas is that just sometimes when I need to concept map and draw things out. And so Adobe Ideas allows you to kind of expand and shrink. And so it's kind of a nice note, note taking things. So normally writing is faster. I'm doing this with my finger though. And so maybe if I had a stylus, it would actually work nicer. The other thing that you can do with it real quickly, and you can see that my daughters have basically taken over this app. Um, boys drool and girls rule is what I was trying to do. Or another thing that you can do is annotate over a photo. So I can see an AMP where if I had a figure that I wanted to annotate over, then this would be very, very nice because I could create a pen that would be a certain size, maybe a little bit bigger, and then I can annotate over that. And notice how awesome my daughter Celie is with her following after dad with a tie. So I can see that this would be a nice app, and I wish I would use it more often because I like that you can take notes really, really quick and expand and, and make it smaller, and you've got color options and opacity options, and you can erase real quick. So for those times when I would rather write fast than even type or use Simple Mind, I would like to use Adobe Ideas, but I haven't really incorporated it yet. But somebody might find it really, really useful as far as a note-taking app or drawing out app, so that's why I wanted to include it. So for my next app, I want to do Digo, and Digo doesn't really do a whole lot on the iPad itself, although you can read things that you find on the web. But the beauty of Digo is starts on the web. Is So what I have here is some of my groups that I follow, and so I follow nutrition, and basically I put in a bunch of, anytime I come across an article that I find interesting, I'll put it into my Digo, and in fact, my students can find this too. How would you actually find those is, um... I'll just Google something really sh short, nutrition news, and Harvard School of Public Health. I'm just trying to find something quick that says, oh, yeah, I might want to keep that. Why we overeat the toxic food environment? That's kind of interesting. That's something we've talked about. Do we live in a toxic environment? So maybe I, will, maybe I want to save that for my students. And so I can click on this Digo button and save it. And then what I can actually do is save it in any one of my groups. So if I save it in my nutrition group, then my nutrition students have access to it. I can also put in tags. I can mark it as read it later. And now if I go back to Digo and update it, that article has showed up in my Digo. The other nice thing about Digo is if I open, let's say we open this one, 
when I come up to do now it's marked it as bookmarked but now I can annotate it which means I can click and I can highlight the web page so you can see that I've actually highlighted the actual results of this and the neat thing about that is back in deal it will keep track of those highlights for me I can add a sticky note and things like that so if I go back now the part that I've highlighted is listed right here so Digo is pretty cool. It's kind of an awesome bookmarking site. As far as when you switch, switch over to the iPad, I guess I should show this pretty cool too. So this one's kind of an, a national one, Digo in Education. So every day in my mailbox, I'll get different sites that other people have highlighted as important in their Digos. And so I basically see what other people are seeing they think is important. So it's kind of a nice way to wade through what's kind of big right now or what other teachers find interesting. All right, so now I'm going to switch over to the iPad. So now that I'm back on my iPad, I'll go to the Deagle app and show you how it looks from there. And essentially, I don't really have the way to read and put things into Deagle. But once things are in Deagle, I can essentially read them on my iPad. So I was just trying to synchronize quick just to show you that that Harvard school that I just showed, Harvard School of Public Health, has come up now on my iPad. So now, that, so now if I found something interesting on the web, I have access to it on my iPad. Or again, here, since I've highlighted this particular phrase, this allusion applies to food on a plate, that highlight sh shows up on my iPad. And the thing about that on the web, you can install a highlight function. I guess I haven't really done it, but you can install a web highlighter if you'd like to. I haven't done it because it's kind of nice that it just shows the notes there. So essentially on the iPad, it's a way for if you've kept something in Digo, you can instantly access it on your iPad. So what I find interesting about this one is I talked to my nutrition students about whether this substance should even be allowed since it's 60% of your daily supply of saturated fats. So that's where I can kind of keep up with current events. If I go back to this, I can keep up with current events or any anytime I find a study anything that's in the news on nutrition I can share it with my students and I can bring current events into the class much more easily anyway so that's Digo so now I'm moving into my long-term apps where I do deeper processing of information those are Bubble Us, Simple Mind, and Prezi and the idea here is to get everything organized so that you can easily put new information into a schema that's been held on the on the computer so I don't have to keep everything in my head, which of course I want to keep things in my head and I, want, I don't want to not memorize things, but it's so much easier to plug things into a big map that's stored on Prezi. So the next app is not really an iPad app, but the overall theme of this entire Prezi or presentation is essentially to learn how to collect a lot of information from a lot of different sources, then kind of sort them into a short-term memory like Evernote or Digo, and ultimately to conceptualize into bigger pictures. And so one of my primary or one of the first things I ever did was introduced by Alan Paterka, which was Bubble Us. And I really like Bubble Us because it allows an infinite kind of concept map. Now, since I've used Bubble Us, I've started to move to Simple Mind. Originally, I didn't use Simple Mind because it was kind of limited in size, but now it's pretty unlimited. So I really like Bubble Us because it allows me to concept map, you know, why do I want to do certain things? Like we've got this virtual desktop project. What are the different ways that you can access it? What does it mean for IT? So this is kind of a small one, but just to scare you a little bit, I suppose, with some of the bigger ones are, are like my workflow. Um, that's kind of also what this whole talk is that I'm giving to you is, you know, find information, find it from YouTube, podcasts, publications, find it from Twitter, find it from following particular innovators like Gary Hamill or Eric Mazur, Nancy Duarte or Dan Ariely or Dan Pink or Steven Wheeler. These are all people that I like to follow on iTunes or I'd like to follow or follow blogs. And then once I have that, then I'm going to sort it with Bubble Us or Prezi or Curate. And you can see that I've kind of adapted a little bit. Ultimately, I want to conceptualize so that I have application in the classrooms and so I can develop competencies rather than objectives. So I can enhance motivation in the student and look at the future of teaching. I'll show you that one later. But essentially, that allows me to branch off to what I think is the ideal education at some point, which I think it's got to be relevant. It's got to have efficient information transfer. You've got to be motivating and you've got to be socially collaborative. That's Sealy walking in on me. 
But I'll keep going. So relevance, it's got to be competency-based. So it's got to be relevant to where they're going. Create competencies and map them with the spatial textbook is what I want to do. It's got to be technology preparatory because there's so much technology that we need to teach just because the student is going to be using technology. Multiple formats organized. So efficient information transfer. I think instructors have to be motivating. So you have to teach with purpose and authenticity and things like that. Anyway, I won't give a whole lecture on my thoughts on pedagogy. But essentially... Bumble S allows me to organize lots and lots of things together. And this one's probably the scariest of all, as I started a Bubble S a long, long time ago, about what I thought the future held for teaching. And so, of course, you go through the different sources of open source, and then there's virtual schools, like there's Iowa Virtual Academy, or that one's not as famous nearly as the Florida Virtual School. Blended learning and hybrid courses, what are my thoughts on that? Um, the Horizon Report always forms a lot of thoughts for me technology goals things like that i've actually got a bigger one still still kind of an updated one and yet, again it just goes through it's allowed it, it's a place for me to collect my thoughts in some sort of organized way this one's very similar but again what it adds on to it is flipped classroom and what i want to work on and again it's got kind of my workflow i use it not only for teaching but I use it for trying to help myself coach my daughter's softball team. So again, it's a huge way as somebody that never played soccer for me to realize that there's different ways to do turns and moves and what are the different feints that somebody can use. So I plan on passing this on to my daughter and show it to her. These are the different, you know, how to do how do you do the Ronaldo or defensive strategies and offensive strategies like support and using width and penetration and things like that what are the different ways that she can improve her footwork so again this is definitely a second brain for me as far as every season I forget what I learned the season before so I can come back to my bubble us and remind myself of the important things when coaching my daughter's soccer team so that's bubble us So next up is Simple Mind, and I like Simple Mind quite a bit because it's quick and simple on the iPad. It also has a desktop version, which is which is nice because then it just creates that synchrony. So whatever's on my iPad is also available on my desktop. Now it does cost money to have the desktop version, but that synchrony is really really nice. And other kind of iPad mind mapping maps don't always have that. And then again, like Bubble Us does not have the iPad app because it's Flash based and it won't run on the iPad. What I use Simple Mind for is really quick, kind of early brainstorming. So, like when I'm thinking about what my evaluation is, I need to think about what is my service to the college, what committees have I served on, what have I done as far as professional development. I want to start a blog, but I haven't yet. And then, what are my goals towards student learning? So, obviously, this is not complete, but it's kind of pre prezzy for me. Soccer positions, it's kind of pre prezzy. Um, what are the different Citrix deliveries? So when I'm trying to worry about how are we going to implement virtual desktop, I want to think about what are the different types of ways that we can do it. Quick, quick brainstorming. Um, I showed you this one before because this was the basis of my talk for why Evernote. The other thing that's not necessarily on here is I have the iPad communicate directly with the PC so I can coordinate or I can go through the cloud. So these are simple minds then that I have in Dropbox. So I'm coordinating in Dropbox. So I mentioned earlier that I like that course model thinking on Coursera. And so some of my thoughts after watching that are, you know, students have to have confidence in their instructor and how do they get confidence in their instructor? So model thinking goes into all the little different things that might affect something. In this case, teaching isn't motivating things like that. Anyway, so that's Simple Mind. So the last one is Prezi, and obviously on some level I don't really even need to do Prezi since this entire presentation has been a walkthrough of Prezi and what you can do with Prezi. But I guess I would like to expand on it a little bit more just to show you. Uh, you can do even more than what I'm doing in this talk right here. I mean, one of the things one of the limits of Prezi, I have to admit, is 
on the iPad. It's not necessarily as robust as it is on the PC, which is fairly obvious, but it's almost non-functional sometimes on the iPad. There's just a not, not enough. So if you want to do really big prezzies, you can't necessarily do them on iPad. For example, I think this one's going to fail, but what I wanted to show, but I'll just describe it. Or rather, I'll just open it on the PC so that you can see it on the PC and just see the full power of Prezi. And again, the main point of this talk is not necessarily to use the iPad, although I find that very integral in doing the whole entire process. The main thing that I'm trying to get across is you need to sort lots of information, put it into some sort of short-term memory, and then conceptualize with it. And Prezi is just amazing for conceptualizing. For example, I've conceptualized my entire nutrition class into six main points. I think the student obviously needs to understand basic nutrition, what DRIs are, and the numbers on the side of the cereal box. I also want them to explore the psychology of nutrition, especially since most of them are going into healthcare, and so the psychology of nutrition plays into the psychology of healthcare. The role of government, the government plays a huge role in healthcare, and it probably plays a big role in nutrition as well, should you outlaw, outlaw certain foods. Nutrition and disease, so we go through carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins and talk about diseases associated with those as well as vitamins and minerals. We go through the nature of science. I think one of the biggest things in nutrition is to understand that it's constantly evolving. Our understanding is constantly evolving, which teaches the student that science is not static. It's constantly changing as well. And then I want them to embrace emerging knowledge. One of my most frustrating things about teaching nutrition is it's always changing. I just want to know what I'm supposed to eat and I'll do that. But the fact is that we don't really know what you're supposed to eat because we keep learning more and more. One of the examples of that is, is sugar is being more and more implicated in heart disease than fat at this point. So what this is, is if I zoom in on these, um, it has everything that I would normally teach. So these, if I was going to give a PowerPoint on the digestive system, there's the slides for the PowerPoint and digestive system. Or when I want to teach the DRIs, you know, I will draw them out in class, but essentially the DRIs. And I can actually take a picture and put it in here. So we want to go through different nutrient breakdowns and things like that. So what's essential versus non-essential? What are the class of nutrients? So these are all basic things. We have a lot of discussion on psychology. We watch this movie called Killer at Large, and that forms a discussion topic. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this one. But I do want to show that essentially you can teach the entire presentation with this. And the thing about Prezi is when you start with Prezi, there's this temptation to zoom and pan or, or flip things around and do things in circles. But, but the big advantage of Prezi is you're zooming in and in and you're zooming back out. So everything's coming back to why study nutrition. You need basic nutrition, why study nutrition. Everything comes back as long as you're zooming in and zooming out. So I've jumped over to this one. I've done podcasting for four years now, and I suppose people come and ask, you know, why are you doing podcasting? And I would like to have a good answer of why and how to do it. But Prezi is really nice, and the thing that this shows is that you can put in videos. So things like Simple Mind or Bubble Us are nice because you can put in HTML or you can put in URLs, but you can't really put in videos and capture that kind of stuff. So the reason I like Prezi is you can expand considerably. And again, there's a lot of content in here as far as should you be the sage on the stage. So Prezi, when you zoom out, it looks like there's not that much there, but there's actually quite a bit there. And I can show even further how much you can put in Prezi by jumping over to this. So I mainly teach AMP2, although I do teach nutrition in AMP1 as well, but I use AMP2 really as my kind of proving ground for improving my pedagogy. So when I look at AMP2, you know, I've kind of divided things up into six main areas. I want to have critical thinking skills. I want to create efficiencies of learning. I want to motivate. I want to have technology skills and share those technology skills with my students. I want to make sure that my instruction is informed by other stakeholders. And I want to include social collaboration. So I don't want to necessarily go through this all and act like I'm some awesome teacher. I'm always, I'm always kind of growing towards something better, I think. But I do want to go through it just enough to show you that there's a lot of detail in here. So from the Iowa State Center for Excellence on Learning and Teaching, they have Bloom's Taxonomy broken down into the cognitive dimension and the knowledge dimension. And then what I've gone ahead and do just, did just to organize to make sure that I'm doing the things that I want to do is I've put some of my, I haven't done everything yet, but I've put some of my assessments in this map. Obviously the idea being that I don't really like that I have a blank right here, that I'm not assessing them on analytical and metacognitive skills, that I want to have my assessments spread across all of these. If you tend to give mainly multiple choice tests, it's really hard to expand across this. So by mapping out your assessments, you can try and fill in the gaps. Or 
you know, I want to increase informative assessment, or I want to make sure that I have a good understanding of what the steps are in critical thinking. I would like to move towards more competency-based instruction, and I want to grade for excellence. I also want to make sure that I'm using right brain skills, and so this is one of the things I've picked up from Daniel Pink, is I want story and symphony and empathy and play, and I want meaning. And again, down here, you'll see this theme all over. I want to find, curate, and conceptualize. That's my big theme in learning right now. Again, don't want to necessarily teach everything, but when you see these small little blocks here, what's actually down in there is quite a bit of information as far as what I would like to see as my perfect LMS. I would like to use something like VoiceThread, which is an app that allows you to put a video and then allows students to collaborate or comment on that, or Simple Mind. I'd like to use the back channel, and I use the back channel. You can use Twitter or Today's Meets. I also would like things to be socially collaborative. I want my students to get the big picture. I would like to be able to continue to work on improving my ability to explain. This is something that came up in my intro. This is a little graph that I follow a lot in my education, that if you are just asking students to memorize things, that's just rote learning. But if you can put some organizational into it, you can motivate your students to be emotionally committed, you can get more meaningful learning. And organization and commitment allow for creative production. So that's one of my big goals, is for students to be creative come up with new knowledge or at least new ways of thinking about things rather than just memorizing things. Obviously this is something that's come up in my in my thinking process a lot, this idea that you have sensory memory, working memory, and long long-term memory and what you need to do is help the student organize information so they can get it into long-term schema and then that long-term schema will allow you to do problem solving. So obviously I think about that theme a lot. Motivation I think is huge. I think the more motivated the student is, the more you can expect to get out of them, whether that's, again, coming back to emphasizing organization or in my personal philosophy, and I know a lot of people probably differ, but I think you need to be more of a manager. Excuse me, I can't believe I said that. You need to be more of a leader in the classroom than a manager. I would like to follow critical thinking-based things, essay-centric assessments, excellence grading, education as a pump. That's from Eric Majure. Education should be a pump, not a filter. Whereas in management, you're just trying to filter people and you think of what you're doing as job-based skills rather than thinking skills. So job skills versus critical thinking skills. And here's my, again, one of the things I think that's important in education is be a model thinker. Some of the different technology tools I want to use in the classroom, stakeholders, I'm trying to not, not dwell on this completely, but there's a lot of ideas that are in here. Like I want to use peer instruction with clickers, so that's the learning catalytics. I want to do more flipped assignments. I want to do more team-based cura curation using Digo and having students create wikis. I use a research project in AMP2, and I would like to facilitate study groups more. So I wouldn't necessarily say that this is the huge end-all be-all of what I think about as a teacher, but it's a way for me to organize a lot of my thoughts on teaching into one little space, and I can consistently or continually add to it. So the biggest thing about Prezi is I think it is literally my second brain where I can store things, come back to them, adapt it, use this kind of outline to create new understandings and to put more information in. So that's why I like Prezi, and that's my to-do list over there. So I'm still adding to it. It's never done. I think that's the biggest thing is I now feel like I have something where I can put things in and I don't always have to memorize it or remember it all. I have a template to continually add things. So that's Prezi. So that's essentially the entire presentation. I think one of the big fun things also about putting things in Prezi is I'll come back to this presentation again in two years like I came back to the presentation that I did two years ago and I can really see my progress and that makes me feel like I've accomplished something and makes me feel kind of smarter too so it really is kind of putting the smart and smart devices thank you